clothes off from love I didn't need the pain once or twice was enough and it was all in vain time starts to pass before you know it you're frozen but something happened for the very first time with you my heart melts into the ground found something true and everyone's looking around thinking i'm going crazy Ooh, but i don't care what they say i'm in love with you they try to draw me away but they don't know the truth my heart's crippled by the thing that i keep on closing you got me open and i keep bleeding i keep keep bleeding i love i keep bleeding i keep keep bleeding i love keep bleeding i keep keep bleeding i love you got me open and i crushed it <clears throat> Speaking of things getting murdered, welcome to the Deadweight Survival Guide, How to Survive Cupid's Axe. Uh, those delightful vocals um, were brought to you by Christopher Daniels, my beloved cool horse. And oh, I am that song was just for you, just so you know, just, just for, for you, just for you, you especially that high note, just that high note. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't need it. It's a gift. You can do with it what you want, but know that I have given it to you. Thank you. I want you to know specifically and purposefully mm -hmm. that I don't want it, and I'm going to drop it mm -hmm. off right here, and I'm going to walk away. I'm going to make it somebody else's problem. Like my love life. Christopher. <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. How are you? Um, I am doing so good because I was serenaded today and that always makes me feel giddy no matter how good or bad it is. I'm not here to judge quality. I am not a judge. I am merely an acceptor of the Lord's gifts. Um, <laughs> but I'm super excited to talk to you today and I'm super excited to talk to you about our cool movies today. Do you want to explain to the people at home what we have going on? Absolutely. So every week here at the Deadweight Survival Guide, we choose a theme. Tonight's theme, How to Survive Cupid's Axe, a delectable and delightful follow-up to last week's episode where we explored all notions of the positive, inspirational love. And we were like, you know what? That is one-sided. We need balance. So now we're going to talk about horror movies involving romance where people die and it's going to be delicious. And after our movie recommendations, we provide you with our own specifically catered, tailored to you tips, tricks, and other delightful tales on how to survive the post-apocalyptic scenario that is Cupid's Axe. Um, you delivered that flawlessly, and she didn't have to look at the lyrics. She killed it. <laughs> I told you I only know it when the song is playing, okay? When I have Leona as backup, I know it, okay? <laughs> when I have Since Leona as memory. backup, you bitch. Because <laughs> let's be honest, in my shower, Leona is backup. And I am lead vocals. I, I feel that about you. And I'm so glad that you are here to impart with us your wisdom. Having been a person, I think I still have onion in my eye. I honestly can't tell. Um, wow. That's cute uh, And I'm so excited because we're talking about romance the way that it was meant to be done. And that is bloody. That is scary. And, and I'm so excited to talk about all with you today because I love you so much. I love you so much. And know what I love about our love is that we often fantasize what it would be like if we ended up in our own horror movie. And I just think that's such a beautiful aspect of true unconditional love. Who would die first? Who would make it to the end? 
what we would utilize in order to dismantle the villain that was coming for us because we're so stunningly beautiful. Uh, so what, beautiful. I mean, what quips and remarks we would say as we're running from the serial killer. I mean, this is what true love is built upon. I think if it's a slasher movie, I'm going to die first because you take better care of your body than I do. And I never learned how to run properly. I always run like it's the last thing I want to be doing because I don't know how to lie really well. And that's exactly how I'm feeling. Um, but if we were, let's say, in a haunted house, I think that I would survive because the people would go after you because they're like, be, be our mommy forever. And because you're just like so giving and so nurturing and so warm, they'd want you. I'd immediately get expelled from that house. See, and I almost see it as like a reverse. I feel like though I may know how to run, that's a question mark because we're not entirely sure. I still have not completed the middle school gym test of running a 10 minute mile. Thank you. And I still graduated. So I feel like I would roll my ankle and trip and fall down the flight of stairs and impale myself. Um, <laughs> And my distraction would would save you. Um, but I feel like in a haunted house, you would be distracted by the spirits and 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 you would say, like, no, I think like let's have a kiki. Like let's let's party. And I'd be like, no, no, they are opening the portal to hell. I am out of here. I am leaving. This house is foreclosed. Bye. <laughs> well, when you frame it that way, it seems like we're both just gonna die. Because if you trip, I'm gonna die of laughter. Um, I will cackle so hard that I am no longer existing on this plane. And in thus, I become the person who then haunts the house. And in a haunted house situation where I'm trying to kick it with these ghosts, I'd be like, Chris, don't make me go to this party alone. Come on, girl. Or I wouldn't even tell you that there's ghosts there. And then I get you into the situation. And then I'm just like, did you hear that? I heard this place was haunted. <laughs> That's exactly what would happen. Either way, you and I are going to spend the afterlife together, whatever that looks like. I hope so. And before we get to the afterlife, we have to get to the death part about it. And I'm excited. Do you want me to go to first? Or I feel like you choose. <gasps> I want to go first. Okay. Uh, I just got told that my computer's being really wonky, so we're gonna see what happens <laughs> today. Um, okay. I hope that it's fine. I don't know what else See, there are those ghosts. Uh, <laughs> there are those ghosts coming at you, and they're just like, oh, you want a kiki with us? Fine. Let's have a kiki. Let's have a kiki. And to start us off on this brilliant kiki, my first film recommendation today is My Bloody Valentine 3D. Um, of course, as you know, I had to do it to him. Had to. Knew it. Had to. And this horror movie that I will be presenting today, um, mostly because I don't like watching them. I feel like they're, they never go far enough that I'd like to see, but my favorite part about this one is the fact that it is in 3D. Um, mm hmm mm hmm for those of you who don't know, this movie deals with Jensen Eccles of Supernatural fame returning to his hometown of Valentine's Bluff. Actually, that was in the original. I don't know if that's in the remake, but let's pretend like I know what I'm talking about today. And he returns home after several years gone away after a terrible massacre where a minor, as you see in this poster featured below, killed 22 people. And now he is back because he wants to sell those minds and rid himself of the entire thing and just call it good and never have talked to these people ever again. And his ex-girlfriend is there. People who want him not to sell the minds are there. So he has to deal with all of that. And unfortunately, he also has to deal with the fact that with his return, we also see the return of this miner and this miner is coming back and he has a grudge and he uses that pickaxe in its full 3d glory there is a point where someone's jaw gets ripped out by one and then the miner like pulls it out and flings it at the camera and it is delicious there's also my dream role ever 
where there is a character who is fully nude for probably close to 10 minutes as she has a chase scene and three people get murdered in the span of this chase scene by the killer and homegirl is out here titties out labia out asshole out not giving an f and fighting back against this killer and i said that's the role that i want and that's the role that i deserve absolutely i mean <clears throat> I have not seen this film, surprisingly. Um, I don't know why. It seems like something that is up my alley. I know. Because let me tell you, she has zero taste and does not love herself. So my Bloody Valentine 3D sounds exactly how one should be spending their Monday nights. <laughs> because I think... <laughs> How do you make something better? You make it 3D because it's not going to add any artistic merit to it whatsoever. But honestly, it's something to distract you from the fact that it is a film called My Bloody Valentine 3D. And and really, anything that's going to elevate that is is essential. So as always, there is a list of films that I have not seen that I always take with me and always end up watching in the following week. And I really feel like this is gonna be the one that I watch tonight. Like I'm really excited. Um, She's on HBO Max for the people at home. Uh, I, th I definitely recommend being able to watch it in 3D if you can, but if you cannot, you are not missing out of the full audience with the 3D. So you know exactly when you're like, oh, this was, this is the way that it was meant. And like the story is just so rich and the, the acting is just so beautiful and the practical effects work, you know, it's like, I think it's there. I don't know. Honestly, I tune it out because I'm really, really bored. A lot of these leads don't have a lot going for them. We're just really trying to go from set piece to set piece to set piece. But it, honestly, that's what makes it so exciting. Sometimes you just want to watch something that you're like, I don't want to invest all of my time into, but I just want to tune into the good parts. And this movie lets you know when the good parts are coming and it is wacky mm. and wild. And the ending, um, there's a lot of comedies. I'm excited to hear your opinions about this infamous ending. Um, I literally don't care. I did not watch it for the ending. I was not so wrapped up in the plot that I was like, wow, oh my God, this threw me for a loop. I was like, all right, are we going to keep killing people or, or what are, are we, we doing done now? Like, so I I, really is the death toll really stopped? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, what is well, your first I, My first pick, okay. So setting the scene, you know how I hate making decisions and I really appreciate it when things, especially um, artificial intelligent algorithms tell me what I should do with my life. And so one night I was on Netflix and all of a sudden they're like, hey, this is something that might be right up your alley. Sure, it's a Polish film and it's not really good, which also feels like on brand for you. So why not go for it? And really it was a very hot man in underwear tied to a bed that really drew me in because when I am looking for films to watch, I'm really looking for a certain je ne sais quoi and that is femdom in films. So I decided to take a gamble and I decided to watch All My Friends Are Dead. Ugh. Let me tell you about this film. So it starts, there's been a massacre and a really dejected, irreverent detective with no apparent concern for humanity or feelings whatsoever is going through this house and examining these bodies and trying to decipher what happened. And then of course, like in all films, they decide to do a playback of everything that happens. So it's New Year's Eve and this guy's having a party and inviting all these friends and you see all these different relationships and couples. You see the really young guy with a really older woman who everyone assumes is a prostitute. You have the vanilla couple who the guy is planning on proposing, even though she wants to break up with him and wants nothing to do with him because the sex is boring. Um, there's the guy who recently got out of rehab, who of course instantly falls for the cosmically inclined Aquarius, who just happens to want to smoke marijuana with him. And what happens is an accident, someone gets shot accidentally. 
And then a series of unfortunate events unfold where the murder is trying to be covered up, but of course it's discovered by two hookers and a Mormon having sex in a bed. And then that person has to be killed because they found out. And then the person who tied the guy in the bedroom so hot forgets about him. And then she gets killed. And so then of course he's helpless, which is my favorite way to have a man is helpless and then there is just a moment where it goes shit wild and i this film is not good like it there are some problematic moments like jesus shows up a couple of times like talking to the mormon having said jesus shows up i mean there's a lot of murder suicide like there's beautiful nudity i mean there's just so many great things about this film i love it rotten tomatoes fuck them did not love it but i love this film because it did not care about it whatsoever. And there's an ending that is kind of up for your interpretation as to what it is and what's happening and what it means, which I also really loved. That it was sort of this oddball way of wrapping things up. But, oh, did I live for this? I mean, there are some great death scenes and just great hot people having sex and killing each other. That is my jam. Um, that is also my jam. And that is why I am pleasantly surprised that I have never heard of this movie before. This might be the one that I'm taking. I'm going to obviously wait to find out the other two picks before I decide on it officially. Um, but given the fact that it is not good, there was a bunch of murder. There is helpless men. There is several nudity and Jesus, Jesus, Jehovah H Christ, the H stands for hatchback shows up in here several different times. That is incredible. And it's on Netflix, which means that it's, Super easy to watch. Um, I'm so excited, I, and I just oh my god, this sounds like a per this sounds like a perfect double feature with my movie. Um, and this one was the one that I would end on because unfortunately Jesus does not appear in my Bloody Valentine 3D, and I think that this is where we need to end it. I think this is the way that we need to go. I mean, like absolutely, because when you think about how to survive Cupid's axe, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And some of y'all discover praying to Jesus for the first time ever when y'all lives are in danger. Suddenly, you're just like, oh, open communication operator. Um, please get me in contact with Jesus H. Christ, please. Um, I'm about to die, and I would love to pray. Thank you. Thank you so much. What is your second choice for the evening? Christopher. Daniel, moving away from the Valentine's Day specific date and going more mm. into what it is to survive love and the entity of love and the power of love. Celine Dion, my personal Jesus. Um, and so I started thinking about the ways that love can be terrifying. And I think that love can be terrifying when you found such a good niche of it. You found a really good partner and you're both working, collaborating on something together. And then unfortunately, because of that project, you have to watch the person that you love destroy themselves for this project. And that is why I chose 1986. Uh, the Fly, starring one Miss Gina Davis, who we mm. all love and adore, and Jeff Goldblum in the only role where I don't find him actively annoying, just passively, um, mm. is really, really exciting. And right out the gate, it just starts with them meeting, talking, and going straight into the plot. And I think that that is so great because it does not be like table setting. You have to know how lonely this person is or how ambitious this person whatever we're gonna get that <laughs> i'm talking about the fly <laughs> um 
Oh, I apologize. Uh, I am talking about The Fly. Uh, I was just informed that we could not hear the title because my internet came out because life is a nightmare and nothing is real. And I hate technology so much. I do apologize uh, for that weird eyebrow that I raised when I saw that poster. Um, the Fly is so fantastic. And for those of you who hasn't seen it, Gina Davis is the star of the film. Some would say that it's Jeff Goldblum. I literally don't care. Um, Gina Davis plays a journalist, a, sci a scientific journalist, and she meets with Jeff Goldblum, who is working on perfecting the art of teleportation. Because, like myself, uh, he hates vehicles. He gets very motion sick, and he'd rather, like, be there. It's not about the journey. It is about the destination, as I have always been saying. And so he is a brilliant scientist. He has figured out how to send... Um, what is the word? Non, non, what is that word where it's not alive? Whatever. He can mm -hmm. send anything that's not alive. Inanimate objects. Wow. I didn't even start the right way. I set myself up for failure for that one. He can send inanimate objects and that's fine, but it's when it comes to living beings, when it comes to skin and flesh that he has an issue with it. Until, with the help of Gina Davis, he's able to figure it out. And one night, he decides that he is going to attempt it on himself. And he gets into this teleportation device and it works perfectly. He ends up and has realized that he has done it. Like, everything's about to break. It's going to be so great, so exciting. Unfortunately, um, there was an extra guest in the teleportation device, and it was the titular fly. And the machine, still running through its issues, has melded their atoms together. So throughout the rest of the movie, uh, Jeff Goldblum's character is slowly turning into this giant, disgusting, goopy, fly-human uh, abomination. And it is from director David Cronenberg. So you know that this movie is about to get juicy, bloody, slimy, and super sexy. And that's exactly what happens. And Gina Davis is, can we save this? How can we prevent this? How can, how can we help you? And she has to stand by as her lover goes through all of these different disgusting things. And I just think it's super impactful to sit down with your partner and watch this movie and be like, okay, well, if you were slowly turning into a disgusting creature, would I stay with you? Would I go away? Would I try to help you? And for me, the answer is I would stick around just to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100%. Uh, I have not seen this film. Um, I know, I know, but I have seen the Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors inspired episode where Bart becomes the fly and then the fly's head is on Bart's body. So basically I've seen the fly. Um, basically. basically it's like the exact same thing. Um, and, but I think you're I think you're correct in, in saying, you know, we always talk about the hardships that we endure in relationships, especially if you make the decision to enter into a marriage and what you're going to vow to each other. And I have never heard in all the weddings I've officiated, like, if you turn into a grotesque mutant creature, like, I'll stand by you. And I feel like that is, like, I, that's a huge hole. Like, that's a huge hole that is is un, undiscovered and untalked about in marriage and relationships is like, what am I gonna do if you start growing horns or multiple legs or wings? Like, am I gonna be offended? Am I gonna try to kill you? Like, am I gonna call, call the government on you and have you arrested and locked up and experimented on? I don't know. You know, but these are great conversations for couples to be engaging in. Thank you. I'm a firm believer that if I have decided to spend the rest of my life with a human being, if I have to, that the second that they start getting interesting, whether it is sprouting another leg or like tentacles or wings, I'm only getting more invested. And in fact, I'm getting more turned on. So that can only be pluses for our relationship. And see, I would love to say that like at my wedding ceremony, I'm like, I promise you and God and all of the two people that we invited here because we're getting a runaway marriage um, uh, that I will promise to love you in sickness and in health. I'd prefer that you were healthy, but 
you can't pick and choose. But if you were to grow wings or tentacles or become a slimy flesh monster, then I will definitely be sticking with you forever. And you never have to be insecure about that. <sighs> That's gorgeous. That's beautiful. Thank you. I've been working on my vows since I was three. I just, I'm waiting to deliver the person that all of these things ring true to them. That's kind of my checklist for dating. Mm -hmm. Be like, mm -hmm. what's your sign? Do you have any tentacles? Oh, you don't? Mm. I gotta go. My mom says that I can't hang out with you anymore. Sorry. Yeah, you're boring. Sorry. Here's a TikTok video. <laughs> Um, follow me online, though, please. Like, this isn't gonna work out, but, like, I'm trying to get those numbers up, please. I'm trying to go live on TikTok. Thank you. Christopher Thank you. Daniels, what is your second choice for tonight? So my second choice follows along a very similar vein. You know, after the sort of irreverent, raunchy uh, comedy that is All of My Friends Are Dead, I wanted to choose something that explores sort of the darker, more shadowy side of love and of the human condition. And there's nothing more terrifying and horrific in this world than children. And I think when we see adult themes played out through the lens of children, I think it becomes more horrifying because we see mirrors of ourselves and we see what we are passing on and how things are played out and the innocence of children are uh, extinguished. So my second pick for the evening is let the right one in. You now. Let the Right One In has had many iterations. It started off as a book, and then the author adapted it into this Swedish version of the film, Let the Right One In. And then for whatever reason, the UK decided to make Let Me In, which is a horrific adaptation of this beautiful story, and I do not recommend it. And it's also a stage play as well that Good Luck Macbeth put on in our 2019 season. So it does have a special place in my heart. And what I love about this film is in some ways it's the original uh, human vampire love story. So you have Oscar who is a 12 year old boy who lives in a broken home, gets bullied by the kids at his school, lives in this apartment complex when all of a sudden one day this strange girl and who we perceive to be her father move into one of the abodes and he starts noticing strange things about Ellie. You know, she doesn't come out during the day. He doesn't necessarily see her eating. She's really weird and doesn't wear shoes and is not bothered by the cold. And immediately at the onset, she's like, we cannot be friends. We cannot have a relationship just so you know. But of course, <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I live my own life. So they developed this beautiful friendship where Ellie really tries to inspire Oscar to stand up for himself. And because he experiences such violence in his life, the only thing that he knows to do is respond in turn with violence. And so he ends up smashing one of the bullies head with a metal pole. Meanwhile, the backdrop is that all of these strange murders are happening and they're trying to figure out who is responsible for these murders. And it's very interesting where the film arrives and the commentary that it makes. And I think this film makes people uncomfortable because we're dealing with adolescents and really pre-teens and we're talking about things like love. And what I find so fascinating is that there is a contract. Love becomes almost this contract of you promise to take care of me and knowing full well, I'm a vampire and I'm gonna live forever and you're eventually gonna grow old and die and be useless to me. So I'm only gonna love you as long as you are useless to me. And Oscar sees this played out and somehow in his mind, whether he thinks he's different or it's not gonna happen to him or like all humans think eventually she's gonna turn me feels that he's going to be different and how they show love for each other. It's destructive and violent and there's death and blood and all of these things. And yet that binds them closer together. And you see, what does a society that's rooted in violence, how is that, how does that impact our lens of what love is? And so if Oscar's only known violence from his family and from the kids at school, how would he know any different? How would he know what love is? 
And so this film, it is dark, it is eerie, it is very uncomfortable. And I think it is so perfect for this theme tonight. Um, Christopher um, Daniels, what's super Daniels interesting is I thought that you should be right, as you know. Um, I love those things about me. Um, there's something going on. I feel like everything's breaking down around me. Everything, I love it. Good guys. You were giving me a compliment. And then I was like, no, he's probably, they're probably giving themselves a compliment. So not me, themselves. <laughs> um, I think it's a great choice. And I think it's a very excellent choice. And I think that you have really great taste sometimes. So please take that as a compliment. Um, but it's so exciting because for all the movie, for all the reasons that you described it, this is a fantastic movie. And it's, it's very, very slow, but not in a way where there's things missing or lack of action. There are things that progress all other way, just like love should and for me the title i know everyone kind of has their interpretation of it and i know i believe in the movie specifically they have a reference to it um but for me the let the right one in is specifically like who are you going to trust with this secret so the main or not oscar but ellie is that her name mm -hmm. i'm making that up yes ellie Ellie has to decide who she's going to trust with her secret and who she is going to trust with actually being the person who helps her out in the situations. As we turn to find out that several player, players have already played in her life. Obviously they have bonded together so well. It is because they have gone through so much together. It is because they understand the violence around them and that they were created and molded after that violence, not necessarily because of their fault, but because of their environment. And it is so beautiful. And it's so in often that we get to see a love story about children. And I mean, not to force sexuality or romanticism on children. That's very, very powerful. Cause I remember being young and having very, very strong connections with those type of people. And this movie explores it in a way that, I mean, this movie is like rated R, so children will not be watching this movie. But it's very exciting that the theme deals with like how fast they have to mature, what's going on in their lives, how people around them treat them, and how sometimes it is a disgusting place to be. How and it's very, very nasty. But the love that helps them out, they become, they form this like symbiotic relationship, and I just love seeing that in this movie, especially about vampires. Vampires are so hot. Oh my god! And there's such, I think what is beautiful about this film is that there are those moments of deep connection set into these really quite gruesome circumstances. So them communicating through Morse code and you're like, that is so beautiful. Like these little children have their own special unique language as a way to stay connected. And yeah, it's just the final scenes are Gorgeous. 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 My favorite things in the entire world. Oh. What is also, my your... Started fighting. Today is weird. Today is a new moon and everything around me knows it. Wow. <laughs> What's your final pick for the evening? Christopher Daniels, um, it's very interesting that you decided to talk about uh, bloody, disgusting, horny, romantic vampires. What my third choice is for tonight. I am, of course, talking about the most romantic horror movie of all time, and that is Bram Stoker's Dracula. This yes, movie. yes. Yes, 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 yes. This movie is fantastic because on top of being just a, a retelling of Dr the Dracula mythos, it does a very, very beautiful thing where it shows Dracula as a fallen angel. Instead of just being this devilish, ghoulish creature of the night, it shows how he came to these circumstances and how all that we have and he is mourning for the love that he can never possess ever again until there is an opportunity to uh, kind of maybe dig back into it. But 
It is such a gorgeous movie. The filmmaking behind it where they tried to do as many practical effects in camera in the vein of like the old 1900s style movies is so great. Gary Oldman playing the titular Dracula, but playing 15 different versions of the count. Mm -hmm. And some of them are handsome and young and some of them are older and weird. And some of them are the literal actual monster. I think he also plays the green mist that seeps in through a window at some point, because why he can do that. He's got the range. He didn't have the range in that Churchill movie where he won an Oscar, but I think this is where maybe that's what they were trying to make up for. And it's just so exciting because like, um, vampires are immediately sexy. And this movie is so horny. This movie almost practically every frame you're just like why why is it hot in here i know that there's like a wind chill coming in but why is it so hot why is it so hot in here and it has you like crossing your leg or like just readjusting picking up the pants a little bit and it is so beautiful just to see that sometimes monsters are just people who have been wronged by the world and are reaching out in a state of anger that they get to because the number one thing that everyone is searching for or that we're told is the most important thing is love. And when the cruel world takes that away from you, what responsibility do you have to give that back? And it is watching Dracula do everything he possibly can, taking names, killing people, attacking people in the name of love is absolutely so beautiful. And then you have Winona Ryder and then you have Keanu Reeves, which a lot of people always talk about his accent being terrible. I think it's endearing. I think we have seen a lot of other Keanu roles that are terrible. I don't think this is the one to kind of like uh, pitch that tent to. Um, and Anthony Hopkins just absolutely going wild and mad. Nobody told him no here in this movie. He said, I'm going for it. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to get you from this side, this side, this side. And we all said, okay. And the, this movie won an Academy Award for its costume design. And Francis Ford Coppola, the director behind the movie, he didn't want giant lavish sets. He wanted sets that trail off into the darkness. But he wanted the costumes to be the set. He wanted you to be able to look at someone and be like, I know when this takes place. I know where they are. And I know what they're going after. And I know what everything is here. And it is just absolutely stunning. I think it's a perfect first date movie. And if they can't hang with this movie, they can't hang with me. Correct. Uh, so this film had such a dramatic impact on my young queer self. Because I was like, oh my God. I think like... Count Dracula is my ideal husband. Like, first of all, he's a count, okay? Hello. Also, like, has a castle. And, like, I'm here for that, you know? Like, I just look gorgeous, constantly draped in furs. And I feel like furs, no matter what season, are always in style and fashion in a castle. So I was like, mm, hi, Dracula. Like, I know you're going <laughs> after, like... Mina, I think that's her name, or Lucy, Lucy, or Mina, both, he want both of them. I mean, just come on now. I was like, hello, like, move over, like, the queen has arrived, because I would make a fierce contest, okay, contest, Draculina, um, <laughs> and along with, I recommend, if you haven't read the book, so if you mm -hmm. haven't read this book, it is one of my favorite books of all time. It is so chilling. It's beautifully written. It is, the text is so rich. It is just an absolutely incredible book. And then seeing the film, you just get such a deeper appreciation because there's a lot of trash Dracula stories out there. Dracula 3000, Dracula 3D, Dracula AD, Dracula versus Wolfman. I don't know, but there's a lot of terrible Dracula films out there. And so none of them can compete with this. Absolutely not. And it was actually um, Francis Ford Coppola who said adaptations, but we've never had one that really sticks to the book. Everyone kind of just takes the mythos and does whatever they want with it. But he was like, I want to stick to the book, obviously with some flair, but he's like, I, the themes that are there, 
the important issues that are there. I want to take in and really do that justice. And that's why for him, it was super important to include Bram Stoker's name in the title because he's like, we would be nowhere right now if it wasn't for that man who wrote this book. So we have to pay him credit. We have to know that we are telling his tale as best as we can. And um, for the rehearsal that they had, he actually sat down the entire cast and they had a book club and they read Dracula together. And he inspired them. He was like, if there's anything else that you feel is missing from our script that is in the book that you feel is necessary and important, tell me and we will add it. And we will make sure that this is such a faithful adaptation and also make it just like this beautiful, gorgeous, gothic romance, this tragic romance. And I think it plays off in every single thing you see. I think the second half kind of just starts lagging a little bit, but the ride that you go on, uh, just watching and seeing how the effects are done practically is such a stunning thing. And I mean, obviously, I hope that one day when we are able to return safely to theater is that you and I could interchangeably play Mina and Lucy. Because like, I iconic white wedding dress is just that's what I want to get married in and also murdered in but also I want to be Mina and I want to be licking Gary Oldman's chest and be like mm, I surrender myself to you give myself to you or one of the three brides honestly I could play whoever because this movie has enough for everyone to do and it is perfect mm, I love it I look forward to that day as well mm. now Chris you can close this- your third pick to close us out for the evening, I've chosen something a little lighthearted to end on. It's actually a film that you and I saw together. And I think really is just so perfect because it has so many of the things that I love in a film. A really sassy and obnoxious female lead, a stunningly beautiful male lead, a serial killer, time travel that's sort of explained but not really explained at all sorority girl fights i mean it just has all of it so my final pick for the evening is happy death day bam 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 now what is so great about this film is that you have tragically broken tree who is in college and just is not really having a good go with it. Like she's having a affair with a professor, hot, but also like not grounded and certainly not loving and not helpful in any way, shape or form. Um, Has tenuous relationships with her sorority sisters. Uh, She is really estranged from her father, doesn't really speak to him after the death of her mother, which she's still grieving about and, and dealing with. So there's a lot going on. And it's her birthday. Yay. Oh my God. So cute. But then like on the way to the party, like she goes into a tunnel and is like murdered by this serial killer that's wearing a baby face, which is like the mascot for the school, which is really effing weird. Like that is so gross. And there's so many feelings about it, but it is a great mask for a serial killer to wear. And then all of a sudden she finds herself back in her bed when her day has started and she's like okay that's kind of weird like groundhog day like ha 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 like maybe it's just like i like foresaw something like maybe i'm just like really in tune and so then she's on the way to her birthday party she's like you know what i'm not gonna take that tunnel like maybe spirit was like "Mm, better not so she goes to her party makes it she's like okay this was just a weird premonition how did that so raven moment who doesn't and then she gets killed at her party and the day starts over again and so all of a sudden she's trying to not only um, identify who the serial killer is and why they are trying to kill her, but also why is she stuck in a time loop? And also she has to explain herself every single time that the day resets, which is like super obnoxious. I hate explaining myself to people. I mean, I really feel like people should just be on my wavelength and anticipate my needs. So like, I get it. That is awful. And then in the midst of all of this, she's trying to reconcile her relationship with her father. She is trying to form a budding relationship with Hadi McHadi and start that. I mean, there is a lot on her plate. 
Okay. That's a lot. And it's your birthday and you're getting killed in a time loop. I mean, that is just some emotional stress that like no guidance counselor can ever prepare you for. So ever. this ever, this film is just funny. It is a good time. It's smart. It's hilarious. The death scenes are fantastic. And there's like a like montage scene where there's just a lot of deaths in sequence. And I was like, thank you. How did you know that's what I am looking for? And the ending is also spectacular because you think it's over and then you're like, wait, it's not over. And that is... That's just great. But it's not like a double tap moment. It's like, ooh, there's like a second ending. <laughs> Love this one. Um, Christopher, what a perfect choice. What a perfect mm -hmm. choice. Um, this movie really took me by surprise because I was like, all right, let's see what this has going on. I'm really not a big fan of the Groundhog day kind of like because like you I hate repeating myself to people I hate having to fill people in on where I'm at and what's worse one step above that I hate people giving me the same information over and over and over again so I have a really hard time watching that because I was like I get it I get that that's part of your nightmare but also skip past this part let's get to the interesting parts and this movie incorporates it in such a delicious way because at first the main character Tree played by Jessica Roth um, doesn't seem to be a person that you kind of want to root for. She is rejected by the world in a bit, and she decides to take that out on literally everyone around her and just kind of create the shallow, vapid character who won't allow herself to get hurt by the world anymore. Unfortunately, she does uh, hurt the people. This beautiful tale of her having to recognize that someone is trying to kill her over and over again on her birthday and having to deal with wanting to do better and become better and potentially help out other people who are also suffering from this slasher who is on the loose and taking names. And it be, it, it's just such a fun romp because you just see her get so frustrated and annoyed. She's like, I'm so sick of this. This is so annoying and I just want to move on with the rest of my life. I have learned the lesson. Let's go. But she really has to grow and change and develop and really take control of her own life. And I think that's super powerful to learn. All of the death scenes are incredible. Um, I wish I could stand her love interest, but unfortunately he said some anti-Semitic things and some super racist things and super pro-police things. So we have decided to move him off the unstanding, or off the stand what? list. What? Yeah. Oh. 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 I gotta say, we have to throw the whole thing out and start again. Um, but it's it's just, just such a fun romp. And I think it's a great movie to watch together because you're just like, man, what would you do in a position like that? Or what, how would you tell me? How would we believe each other? I think it's super fun to have the conversations. And also you have a queer uh, director who is ahead of this one and the sequel, which I think is a wonderful follow-up despite what you may have heard in the streets. Um, also agree, love the sequel. Like, because you're like, how do you do a sequel of this film? And how they did it was just brilliant. And I was like, okay, I'm here for this. I'm, I'm, I'm here for I was this. Crying. I was sobbing in the theater because the second one says, okay, Tree, you think you've grown? You think you have developed and changed? Let's test it. Let's see what that's about. And I'm just like, wow, you are really putting her through it. And there is a planned um, trilogy that they have. But unfortunately, because the second one's didn't make it kind of off the table for now. So I really need everyone to uh, tweet Jason Blum right now and Christopher Langdon and be like, hey, we are in full support. Please, let's get the third one. Because it ends on a brilliant note of how they could go in the third route. And it takes one of the characters from this one and the second one who is just absolutely atrocious but perfect. And I want to see her deal with this kind of situation. And that's what we need and that's what we want. And if there's any wish that I would like to make come true on this beautiful day of the saints and of love, it is that we get a third Happy Death Day movie. Mm. Like, take action. Like, what are you doing with your life? Like, what, yeah. what are you doing? Take action. It caused zero sense to tweet at Jason Blum and harass him. Do it. I don't have a Twitter account. 
See, Chris is doing it. Chris doesn't even have a Twitter, and he's already tweeting over there. Look at him go. That's power. Oh. And one single finger. That's the gay finger. Gays can do anything with one finger and be like, ah, one. got that taken care of for you. Sat. This is what we call gay sterity. No, that didn't work. I tried. I really did. Like dexterity with gay, gay sterity. No, it doesn't work. It's like a really like weird combination of consonants. But you know what? How to survive Cupid's acts? Try. Like that's what you got to do. You got to try. <laughs> no one has ever survived on accident all right you have to put in effort you have to make sure that you know the rules that you have seen the movies that you're staying out of danger and honestly the number one thing that you can do is just don't fall in love save yourself that heartache save yourself that potential um, um axe wound. honestly become the person that you want to see in the world that soulmate thing or whatever and honestly, you'll be super fine. Stay out of other people's business. Don't have anyone else fall in love with you. Don't be the reincarnated version of someone else's love and be like, whatever is going on with you has nothing to do with me. Leave me alone. And out of sheer will, they will not attack you. Absolutely. And, you know, in a, like, mythological sense of things, I talked about this last week. Like, oh, so Cupid brings an axe to the fight? Like, hello, honey, you have choices, Okay, flamethrowers, set their wings on fire, okay? Like, bow and arrow, use their own weapon against them, okay? They won't see it coming, right? Like, they come with an ax, and you're like, ha-ha, joke's on you, bow and arrow. Uh. Or, like, throwing axes. Like, so really, if you are coming to a bout with Cupid, like, make sure you are armed, and like arm significantly more than they are. And then just blast them out of this ethereal mythological world. And then you'll be like, great. I don't have to deal with that anymore. Thank you. Next. You stay strapped. And honestly, that's the perfect advice for any situation. Stay strapped. Whatever that means for you, whatever is going to get you out of that situation, make sure that you're carrying a piece with you. I personally carry a small hammer in my bag. So about that action you do fall into maybe potentially the santa claus film kind of trope where is if you kill santa claus you then have to become santa claus i'm mm. concerned that mm. if you kill cupid you will have to become cupid and if there's one thing that i hate more than other people in my business is other people forcing me to become part of their business because really mm. I'd, i if i be, if i get the power to be cupid i'm gonna fuck everything up first of all everyone's gay Everybody's gay. Sorry. Hands down. I Hands am down. a firm believer that if you chose a heterosexual lifestyle, that that is up to you, and I'm not here to do that. But if I'm in charge of who you fall in love with, girl, I'm going to make you question everything, even just as a life lesson. Maybe potentially you can then meet back up with your wife. But I just need you to know the experience so that we can be more progressive and honestly move the society a little bit forward. Um, so I think kidnap Cupid. Make him work for you. Mm. You don't have to kill them, but just be like, hey, listen, those two over there, they look like they're both pretty lonely. They look like they would feed off each other really well. I don't know why you ain't shot them before, but you can do that now. And then when finally you run into the love of your life, say it is a Zac Efron-esque person, you're like, Cupid, Cupid, this is the final gene in a bottle moment. Shoot mm. that motherfucker. Mm. Shoot him mm. down dead, bleeding, gaping, woundy. And I will mm. care for him and he will fall in love with me. You, you, I can save you on the arrows. You only got to shoot one. I'm fine. I'm already there. Just one. And I will let you go. Uh, that is so beautiful. I mean, and, and so, like, you are helping Cupid. Like, you are doing the Lord's work. And that's really, like, that is just so beautiful. Like, Jesus would approve. Like, Jesus would, like, show up and be like, you did good. Mm -hmm. don't i know it no. release me from this flesh no. vessel already then right now if you find yourself in any of the situations that we had mentioned previously in our films i think one of the greatest things is knowing what your worth is in any relationship knowing you know that you are worth and have value and that you are a lovable human being and that you deserve to be respected and you deserve unconditional love that is not rooted in violence um, is a powerful thing to understand. Also, don't have stupid ass friends. Like, do not 
have stupid ass friends. Stupid ass friends throw stupid ass parties where stupid ass shit happens because some stupid white cisgendered heterosexual guy decides to do something stupid and then it fucks everybody's life up. So don't have stupid friends and don't go to their stupid ass parties, okay? That is one of the ways that you can protect yourself from Cupid's acts. Also, if someone doesn't come out into the daylight, dump them. Unless they're willing to turn you into a vampire. But if that's not on the table, and that's not on the table from day one, okay? Like, I'm not going through some lengthy engagement. I know you have eternity, honey, but I do not, okay? Time is money, and I'm broke. So I'm going to need to know if you are going to make me a vampire on the first date. Because if you're not, thank you next, okay? Here's your next victim. It's our waiter. I'm broke, so I don't have money for the bill. So eat them instead so I can run out and skip the bill, okay? There you go. I'm helping you out. You're helping me out. I got a free meal. Done. And that's knowing your worth, baby. That's what that's all about. You need to enter any relationship as it would be a contract. And you have to say, here are the ground rules for which I want. Are you a vampire? If so, you need to turn me into a vampire also by second date. Number the second. Um, if you are a scientist, I get to be the one that profits off of you when something inexplicably goes wrong. I could be the one that tells a story. I will be the one being interviewed by Gail Weathers. Um, if you are dealing with just stupid serial killers who are out murdering people. Back to Chris's thing. Don't hang out with stupid people. I know, Becca, that you think that hanging around stupid people makes you smarter. No, it makes you the biggest dumb person in the entire room. Why? If you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Hanging out with stupid people just brings on, it begets, more stupidity. And you're about to die. You're about to get murdered because all your friends were out here partying in a mine and you were like, um, we have a test tomorrow, you guys. And they're like, come on, let's get wasted. <laughs> and you're like, okay, sure. Mm, maybe Kevin won't be there. Kevin don't give a fuck about you. Kevin's no. already in the mine getting raw dogged by some other homie. Like, stay out of other people's business. Don't have stupid friends and honestly, you'll be fine. And what a beautiful advice just for life. Like, do not, like, you want to survive the apocalypse. You need to make sure your team is smarter than you. Because honestly, if you're like me, you will be the dumbest person on the team. And there's only room for one dumb person on the team. No vacancies. It's taken. Move along. Okay? There's only room enough for one comedic relief. Okay? That is moi. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I cannot wait until we have to perform in the Deadweight Olympics to see who would actually survive in a horror film. Because as you said, there can only be one. And I don't know. I think I'm a dumber bitch than you are. You're at least funny. I don't know what I could contribute to a thing. So we're just going to have to see who would actually survive and who um, wouldn't. Deadweight Olympics needs to be a thing. It needs to be, okay, coming at you, 2021, the Deadweight Olympics. I'm so excited. Um, and with that, it seems like we have wrapped up another beautiful episode. Christopher Daniels, as always, such, such a tremendous pleasure. Do you want to tell people at home what they're in store for next week? Absolutely. So next week is a special episode because every once in a while we invite slash force our producer Derek Nance to join us on this side of the screen. And so he will be joining us as our guest host as we explore how to survive the matrix. Um, I'm so curious to tune in because as you can tell, I don't know how any of this works. And if it wasn't for incredible people like Derek Nance running everything behind the scenes and whispering in our ears, um, I wouldn't know what to do. So I'm so excited to bring him on again. And hopefully I'm going to be taking notes on what he has to recommend because that man has got it going on in all the right places. Um, so I'm super excited and, uh, I'm excited to see you again, obviously. And I'm excited to, unfortunately, so thank you. Of course, and I just have just one more thing to say to you before we part this evening. I 